I informed my wife Emily that my seminar ended a day earlier than planned, but I couldn't change my flight, so I'd be back on Tuesday night. She was supposed to pick me up at the airport around 6 o'clock. She expressed some frustration about me being away for another night, but said she would be delighted to see me. After thinking about it for an hour, I realized I had been away from home a lot and should prioritize my wife, with whom I've lived for 17 years. I decided to go to the airport and make an effort to change something. I almost gave up but then noticed there was a flight to an airport near our hometown. The airport I usually use is about an hour north of our place, but the other airport was almost two hours to the south, and I had never used it before. I checked and found there was a flight leaving for that airport in half an hour, so I went to the counter to purchase a ticket. I was surprised at how easy it was. An hour later, I was in the air, and three hours later, I landed. I rented a car and expected to be home around midnight. Emily had to find a way to express her joy at my early return. I mentally listed some assumptions and smiled to myself. I decided not to call her and wanted to make my return a complete surprise. It was just before midnight when I arrived home. The house was dark and Emily's car was gone. I found it peculiar as I brought my bag inside and unpacked, wondering where she could be at this hour but deciding not to jump to conclusions. I called her cell phone and she answered on the third ring. I greeted her and pretended to check on her well-being. She informed me that it was well past midnight and she had been asleep. She assured me that she would be at the airport the next morning at 6 to pick me up. I was puzzled and curious about her being asleep but not at home. I inquired about her whereabouts, mentioning that I had tried calling our home phone but got the answering machine instead. She explained that she was in bed and that our phone didn't work, mentioning a repairman scheduled for the next day. My head was spinning as I wondered whether she was in bed upstairs. I had been unpacking in the same room and hadn't seen her. It seemed unlikely that she was blatantly lying to me, but I couldn't help but wonder why. I then informed her that I wouldn't be on the six o'clock flight and that I'd be staying a few more days. I promised to call her when I had the exact time and day for my return. She expressed her longing for me and asked me to come home as soon as I could. I assured her that I couldn't wait to see her and said my goodbyes. As I finished the call, I couldn't help but notice a hint of laughter in her voice. I dialed my home phone number, and it rang. Normally I would contemplate answering the phone and having a witty conversation with myself, but I didn't have the heart to do it. I went up to our room and searched under the bed and in other hiding spots. I thought to myself, Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building. I'm in sales, not rocket science. But my instincts were sharp, and I sensed something suspicious. How foolish had I been? Quite foolish. That was my honest assessment. The next morning I got up early and moved the rental car to the other side of the street. Around seven in the morning, I saw Emily's car pull up to the house with a man driving. I hid in the junk closet in the foyer with the door slightly ajar. Emily unlocked the door and they entered. She informed him that she needed to change and get ready for work. She mentioned getting clothes for the next day to avoid returning in the morning and said she'd be back in ten minutes. He chuckled and replied that he'd help, but then he'd have to make love to her again. Emily playfully warned him that she'd have to fire him for being late and mentioned that he seemed to enjoy the fact that she worked under him. She also commented on how his wife considered her the perfect secretary. I couldn't help but wonder what she would say to his wife, considering she found him obnoxious and arrogant. He had only been with the company for a couple of weeks as far as I could remember. He laughed and mentioned that he had already told his wife about Emily, noting that she was the same age as his wife's mother and much lighter in weight. He joked that when his wife saw Emily, he'd have to fire her anyway. He then added that he had informed his wife he'd be house hunting that week and might not be away from the hotel for a couple of days. Emily rejoined them and they shared a laugh. She looked stunning and her boss was named Mr. Boss. They embraced and he gave her a slow, passionate kiss. I felt tempted to grab an umbrella from the shelf and voice my disapproval. He suggested that she spend the following night with him, going out for dinner and returning by 8 p.m. He mentioned the possibility of showing her the lodge after talking to the owner. Emily recommended the idea and playfully asked what kind of tour he would like, adding, What if my husband comes home early? His name was Jeff. Jeff reassured her, mentioning that I would call him to arrange a pickup at the airport, giving him a day's notice. He emphasized that if I didn't call today, 
I wouldn't be returning home tomorrow. Emily found this satisfactory and replied, suggesting that I was a seal, and that in the unlikely event of any issue, I'd probably offer Jeff a beer and apologize for any inconvenience. Jeff, in turn, suggested that I sounded like a pushover, and that his wife would be furious and potentially cause him trouble if he cheated on her. Emily chimed in, saying that fear kept most men in line, though he didn't seem too afraid of his wife most of the time. Jeff responded by explaining that he'd be in deep trouble if he cheated and would be lucky to save his life. He added that his wife was in Houston, which made him feel relatively safe. That's when I stopped listening as they left the room. My face turned red, and I felt my blood pressure rise. Not only had my wife been unfaithful, but she also appeared to dislike me. I sat down to contemplate the situation, and a plan slowly began to take shape. I recalled that Emily had mentioned her new boss was being transferred from the company headquarters in Houston. I needed to find out his name, so I made a few phone calls. A few discreet questions to the female receptionist at Emily's workplace quickly provided me with all the information I needed. His name was Jeffrey Ross, and he had a wife and two teenage children. She would stay in Texas until the kids finished their school year, and then they would join Jeffrey in Springfield. He would search for a house every night after work. I searched for the last name Ross in Houston on the internet directory and found three Jeff Rosses in Houston. With my first call, I hit the jackpot. I inquired if she was Mrs. Jeffrey Ross and she affirmed, asking how she could assist me. I asked if her husband worked for the Halifax company, and she confirmed that he did. I fabricated my identity, claiming to be Don Watson from Halifax, and mentioned planning a small party for her husband Jeff and her. I explained that they would receive round-trip tickets to Springfield as a surprise for Jeff. She responded positively and inquired about the date of the event. I refrained from giving a direct answer and instead conveyed that the event would take place the following night. I provided flight details and explained that the company would reimburse Jeff for the expenses. I emphasized the need for secrecy, and she promised not to divulge the information to anyone. Next, I started calling Emily's friends and family to invite them to her surprise party. I informed them that Emily had received a promotion from her boss, which warranted celebration. Everyone was pleased with the explanation and the need to keep it a secret from Emily. I asked them to arrive at our house by 7 p.m. to ensure Emily's presence. To ensure a smooth party, I contacted a local restaurant and ordered food and drinks, specifying that it should be set up on the veranda next to the living room by our pool. This was a special touch, as Emily had always wanted a party on that veranda. I left instructions for the caterers and explained that the house might be empty when they arrived, but they could set everything up on the outdoor veranda by going around the house. The next day, I arrived at the airport half an hour early. As passengers were heading to the baggage area, I approached a couple of unaccompanied women and inquired if they were Mrs. Ross. While talking to one of the women, I heard someone addressing me. She introduced herself as Mrs. Ross and asked if I was there to pick her up. I was almost speechless when I saw her. She looked like a movie star. I introduced myself as Ron and explained that my wife worked for her husband. I decided to think on my feet as she seemed a bit suspicious. I humorously mentioned that I was often told I had married an older and larger woman, but reassured her that it was just because my wife had more experience and there was more to love. She pondered this for a moment and then smiled, and I felt relieved. We collected her luggage and headed to the parking lot. When we arrived at my house at 6.30, I explained to Mrs. Ross that it was an outdoor party in honor of her husband and also a celebration for my wife's birthday. As the guests began to arrive, the caterer completed the setup and I was genuinely impressed. It looked like a top-notch party, and I hadn't realized it could be organized so seamlessly. By 7.30, everyone I had invited was in place. I asked them to park behind the church a half block away so our driveway would be clear. I explained to everyone that I would hide in the living room and when the guests of honor pulled up to the house, I would turn off the patio lights. This would be a signal for them to be very quiet. We had sliding glass doors leading to the veranda, and there were vertical blinds that could be adjusted using cords. One cord opened the blinds horizontally, while another separated them. We also had heavy curtains that we used during cold weather. These curtains were large enough for me to hide behind as I reached for the cords of the vertical blinds and the light switch on the veranda. A few minutes before eight, I noticed Emily's car pulling up in front of the house. I turned off the lights on the deck and concealed myself behind the curtains to create a quiet ambiance. The door opened, and I could hear Emily and Jeff laughing. 
I thought to myself that it was reassuring to know they were enjoying themselves. Jeff, in a light-hearted manner, expressed his eagerness for some private time, mentioning that they rarely had a moment alone. He helped Emily remove her dress, revealing that she was wearing only a thong. They both seemed to be in high spirits as Emily playfully took off her thong. She commented on Jeff's constant playfulness, and he pushed her onto my chair, and their liaison began. Carefully, I turned on the light. Emily was taken aback and demanded an explanation for my presence, her question appearing somewhat simplistic to me given the circumstances. I calmly reminded her that this was my house, emphasizing that my name was on the deed. She expressed surprise at my early return, and I casually acknowledged it. Jeff muttered something about needing to leave and having matters to attend to. I offered him a drink, which seemed to surprise both him and Emily. I could tell Jeff was contemplating Emily's earlier assumption that I would offer him a beer if I caught them together. I couldn't help but smile as I observed his thought process. Before Jeff could respond, his wife abruptly entered the room from the veranda, clutching a large purse and waving it about vigorously. His surprise left him virtually defenseless, and he ended up about five feet away from his previous position. Subsequently, Emily's mother and sister joined the scene. Emily, still undressed, received a scolding from her mother who instructed her to get dressed and jokingly suggested she consider a career in adult entertainment after the recent performance. Emily was too shocked to respond, and when I turned on the porch light she realized that 20 other people were looking at her. I went outside, grabbed some potato salad and wings, and fetched a can of beer from the fridge. I returned to my seat and observed Jeff's struggle to sit down, as well as Emily's attempts to regain her composure. The entire situation was undoubtedly frustrating, and I couldn't help but think that I wasn't the one responsible for this mess. Emily and Jeff had placed themselves and their loved ones in this uncomfortable situation. Ultimately, it was better for everyone to know the truth and move forward. As time passed, the situation settled down. Emily's cousin took Mrs. Ross to the motel, while another cousin assisted Jeff to the car and provided him with a ride to the motel. Emily's mother asked if Emily wanted to go with them, but Emily declined. Her mother expressed understanding of my likely upset and acknowledged that Emily deserved a good scolding but believed she was already suffering enough. Then they departed. Emily hid in the bathroom and I heard the shower running. I've never enjoyed beer and wings so much. Sitting alone and reflecting on the events of the evening, I thought to myself that, once or twice in life, everything aligns perfectly and the plan actually works. After finishing my salad and wings, I began cleaning up. Cleaning up after this crowd took quite a bit of time. I had to store the leftovers in the fridge and freezer. It was past midnight when I sat down at the table with the last beer of the evening, finally able to relax. Emily entered the room and took a seat across from me. I asked her if she was happy and if that's what she wanted. I wondered why people started forming such opinions. I questioned whether I had done anything to give them that impression and even suggested it might have been her doing. She responded by mentioning the incident when I got caught with my boss. She wondered if anyone would think that's what promiscuous women do. Emily expressed her frustration at me for not coming to her if we had any problems instead of inviting the whole neighborhood over. I grinned and asked her if we had a problem. She continued, explaining that she never meant to be rude with me and that she never thought I would find out about my boss. She accused me of intentionally hurting her. I pointed out that hosting a surprise party for my beloved wife at our house couldn't be worse than being unfaithful outside of our marriage. I suggested that not many people would agree with her perspective. Finally, she said what I had been waiting to hear for so long. Emily reasoned that if I had been around more, none of this would have happened. She claimed that I hadn't paid enough attention to her, making her vulnerable to Jeff's advances. I couldn't help but laugh heartily. She was trying to blame me and make me apologize for her own actions. She appeared so foolish to me. As I closed the bedroom door behind me and locked it, a profound satisfaction washed over me. My chains had been broken. I was emotionally liberated and soon to be legally free. I eagerly anticipated my new life. All right, that was a fun story. Now let's move on to another exciting one. Stay tuned and let's dive in. You know, I should be at work right now. But instead, I'm surprisingly calm, sitting at the kitchen table, enjoying a cup of freshly brewed coffee. I needed this to ease my nerves. I've always found this to be a very soothing routine. 
I used to do it regularly when our kids were young. I'd wake up about an hour earlier than the rest of the household just to savor the peace and quiet. It was sort of a hobby of mine. I'm Evan. Evan Johnson, to be precise. I've been happily married for 25 years. Well, I was happily married until a couple of hours ago. We have four children, and the last one moved out last year. My wife seemed to be struggling with what she called empty nest syndrome, I think. So I encouraged her to find a hobby. I think she found one an hour ago. I didn't know his name. She just kept calling him Stallion and urging him on with phrases like, Do it, Stallion. Come on, baby. I know you can do it. It was odd that the aroma of my favorite coffee filling the house didn't interrupt their activities. Usually, when I brewed coffee, my wife Audrey would rush downstairs even before it was ready. However, Audrey seemed quite preoccupied, which might explain why she hadn't noticed the coffee aroma yet. There were more words exchanged between them. She asked him to tell her how much better he was than her spineless husband, and he replied, Oh my God, you're so much better. I considered engaging the safety on my weapon, deciding it was a cautious move just in case. After all, her boyfriend was a cop. How did I know that? Because when I arrived home early, his uniform and gear belt were scattered across my living room floor, along with all of my wife's clothes. Amidst their passionate exchange, their words were clear. That's it, baby. Do it for me. Harder. I've never felt anything like this until you came along. And thank God you did. The constant creaking of the bed and rhythmic thumping of the headboard against the wall made it difficult for me to focus on my task at hand. I couldn't be certain how much time I had, but judging by the duration of their activities in what used to be my bedroom, a place I had no intention of entering again, it seemed I had ample time. It was evident to me that this was not their first encounter, as I overheard my wife expressing a desire for increased frequency. Damn it, baby! We need to find a way to meet two or three times a week instead of just occasionally. This sentiment came from my beloved wife. Or at least I believe that's what she said. How did I end up in the middle of this nightmare? It was really foolish. I went to work and forgot my briefcase. No, I actually left it in the garage because I placed it there to rescue the cat from under the hood of my car and forgot about the briefcase. Tabby was our second cat. One cold winter morning many years ago, I forgot to tap on the hood before starting the car. And that was the end of Clarence, our first cat. There's nothing like the sound a cat makes when it gets caught in a fan belt spinning at about a thousand revolutions per minute, not to mention all that fur flying around. Clarence wasn't clever enough, and apparently neither was I. You're never going to let that weakling you call your husband touch you again. No, he'll never touch me again, I swear. My briefcase wasn't that important, so I was just going to leave it behind. But I had to visit a client who drove me straight to my house. Tack. Anyway, I turned onto my street and immediately saw a black and white police car parked out front. I felt like someone had stabbed me in the heart. I assumed something terrible had happened to my devoted wife. I pulled into the driveway, nearly hitting my wife's brand new silver Lexus LS sedan. Her plaster garden gnome wasn't so lucky. I didn't even close the door and ran into the house. That's how I ended up here, drinking coffee. Take me now, stud. Make me feel good. God, I've never felt anything so good. It was very unpleasant, and instead of coffee, I really wanted whiskey. But I figured I'd still need a clear head. I had to admit that their passionate screams were very disturbing, and seeing it was even worse. But I had to see it, if only to get the necessary video and audio. Honestly, seeing them tumbling around in my bed wasn't the most disturbing part. The most unpleasant part was the verbal humiliation my wife heaped upon me. God, you're so much better than Evan. Give it to me, baby. All of it. Apparently, this really spurred her lover on because the whole house started shaking along with the bed, and his swearing and grunting went up a few decibels. Let me tell you, it is a shock when your wife sleeps with her lover in your marital bed. And yes, they did it on my side. My wife was breathlessly riding him a cowboy style and telling her lover how much it turned her on. That's when I ran to the bathroom, bent over the toilet, and threw up my breakfast. I was surprised they didn't hear or smell it either. I guess they were deeply focused on their activities. A part of me found it hard to believe, even after witnessing and hearing enough to convince a jury about what was happening. But my wife was 50 years old, and the guy she was sleeping with couldn't have been more than 30. He was in excellent shape and my wife wasn't much of a match for him. I might not be a macho man, but come on, why go for someone else's wife who's in shape? It just doesn't make sense. 
It seemed to drag on forever, but after about 90 minutes, it suddenly got very quiet. I guess they must have taken a break. Then I heard my wife asking, what's that smell? Her boyfriend didn't respond. I just heard her exclaim, oh my God. There was a lot of commotion, opening and closing closet doors, dresser drawers, and laundry baskets. I assumed they were cleaning up any evidence of their affair. I made a mental note to get tested for venerous diseases. They saw me at the same time and Audrey gasped because, well, there I was and her lover did the same. He glanced at his uniform and seemed dejected. It's not there, stud. What? Your service arm. Your boss took it with him when he left. Thoughtful guy. He almost started to disappear right in front of my eyes, and then I saw his lips quiver in desperation. He dropped to his knees, losing the sheet in the process, frantically searching through the pile on the floor. He took this too. I think he called it your throwing arm. I guess what really upset him was the fact that the serial number had been removed. That's like five to seven years right there. Former officer Stad Johnson looked crushed by this revelation. Like I said, he's a thoughtful guy. We had a nice chat while you two lovebirds were busy upstairs. Audrey quickly glanced out the window toward the street. Yes, he took the patrol car as well. Your boss mentioned you were providing security at the construction site. He was going to take your uniform too, but he figured you might need it when you leave here. But where was I? You could call your wife for a ride home, but probably not. She was too upset about that video. I emailed it to her. It was hard to understand what she was saying, but it had something to do with her father, who was the chief of police. How could you do that to your kids? She told me about them. You seem to have a nice family. Despite the situation, I was kind of enjoying myself at this point. It was like having a fish on a line, and I was just reeling it in. I'd ask my wife to drive you, but her car's been impounded. What? Audrey's. She let out a high-pitched squeal. The police impounded your car, Audrey, because there were a couple of ounces of unaccounted-for marijuana in the front seat. Sergeant Mark said they usually just write a ticket if they do anything at all, but he felt they owed me something for all the trouble the police department caused me. Don't worry, he said. You can probably pick up the car in a few days after they've done all their forensics. Oh my God. At this point, she wasn't screaming. It was more like a sad moan, similar to a lonely hound howling at the moon. Well, officer, I think it's time for you to put on your uniform and leave. So he did. After he left, my wife finally regained her speech. Please, Evan, I love you. It didn't mean anything at all. It was just a fling or something like that. Oh man, I wish you'd told me that sooner. I was worried you loved him and were going to divorce me. Now I feel bad. I overreacted, didn't I? You know I love you. Of course I love you, Evan. Why would you doubt that? Well, besides the whole infidelity thing, making love to your lover on my side of the bed and calling me a stupid idiot covered in crayon, there were a few other signs. Oh, honey, I never actually did that. It was just bedroom talk to get us in the mood. Wait, you said you overreacted. Evan, what did you do? She looked annoyed. Evan, what did you do? Up until now, she seemed to be in shock, but now she was clearly nervous and paying close attention. Well, I'm sorry, but just when I thought you didn't love me anymore, I sent the video to our kids. I just wanted them to see who their new daddy would be. You might have to wait a little while before you call them. They seemed upset for some reason. I thought they'd be happy for you. Well, that's what I did. Oh my God, you didn't. I just nodded. I forgot to mention one more thing, but you probably already know that your lover's wife works for the same company as you. I think she mentioned that she works as an executive assistant to the CEO. Don't worry, I told her not to fire you because you'll still need your job, even if you get transferred to Little Rock. When I talked to my attorney, she said that since you make more money than I do, you'll be paying me child support for a few years. She thinks it will be around $3,000 a month. I know most cheating husbands refuse to accept this, the macho type, but that won't be me. I plan to take some time off from work and go on a long fishing vacation to cope with my pain. Just like the song goes, deep sea senorita fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm not exactly sure why the lawyer requested a picture of you. She mentioned something about giving it to your father, but perhaps it was to have it on hand in case any officers wanted to engage in bad things. Or maybe it was to see if anyone else was interested in dating you. 
Nonetheless, I provided her with a photo. I also shared a copy of the video with your mom and dad and all your colleagues. Why were you so harsh, Evan? Well, honey, I wasn't trying to be harsh. I just wanted everyone to know who your new partner is. Your friends on Facebook appeared to be happy for you. At this point, Audrey had almost shut down. She sat on the floor, wrapped in her sheets, crying, shaking her head, and murmuring, This can't be happening to me. All right, dear. It's time to get dressed and prepare your bag. Your parents should arrive soon to pick you up. Pick me up? Well, of course, you'll need a place to stay. The house will have to be sold as part of the divorce, I told her later. Divorce? You seem to have some questions, dear. That surprises me. What did you expect would happen when I found out? Well, you didn't anticipate getting caught. Should we keep having this pointless conversation? For a few minutes, it was quiet upstairs. She didn't utter a word, aside from the occasional wheeze and sob. Why is it that cheaters always cry when they get caught? It's a terrible thing. If getting caught is so unpleasant, then please, don't cheat in the first place. About ten minutes later, she came downstairs, dressed but without her suitcase. Evan, honey, we're really... Then I heard the car of her parents pulling up in front of our house. Farewell, Audrey. As always, I held the door open for her, being a gentleman. All right, that was a fun story. Now let's move on to another exciting one. Stay tuned and let's dive in. That evening didn't go as expected. The house was eerily quiet and I couldn't find my wife, Helen, or our kids. Helen and I, Mike Lewis, have been married for 11 years. When I realized the silence, I noticed a note on the table. Mike, I'm sorry I can't tell you this in person, but I'm too much of a coward to face you. I met someone else and fell in love. The kids are with me and safe. The divorce papers are in the envelope under this note. As you can see, I'm not asking for anything, Helen. Naturally, my day and my life took a nosedive within moments. I was pacing around the kitchen, swearing, going through the divorce papers, and finally slumping into a chair. Helen was leaving me the house and all our money, taking only clothes for herself and the kids, along with their toys. The most infuriating part was the last demand. Helen wanted me to sign adoption papers for my kids, allowing her new partner to adopt them. It felt like a done deal. At least I now knew who she left me for, Henry Carslake. I decided to call my soon-to-be ex-wife. I greeted her with a curt, Hey, Helen. She replied with a simple, Hi, Mike. I proceeded to inquire about her situation, asking, What's happening? Helen explained that she had met someone else and fallen in love with him, as she had mentioned in her note. I responded skeptically, expressing my doubts. Yeah, of course you did. No one just leaves a marriage and sleeps with a guy. I just hope it wasn't in our bed. Helen requested that I refrain from swearing and act civilized. After taking a shower and changing my clothes, I went out to eat since cooking wasn't appealing in my mood. The food was decent, so I decided to head to a bar and have a couple of drinks. After the day I had endured, I felt like I was owed that much. The man Helen left me for was the owner of Cars Lake Construction Company. I had done some work for his company in the past, but that was about to change. My friend Paul spotted me at the bar and commented on my rare appearance, asking if I had managed to get away from my family for the evening. I replied that it was something like that and explained that I had returned to an empty house with a packet of divorce papers. Paul expressed his surprise upon learning that Helen was divorcing me and commented that he didn't see it coming. I echoed his sentiment, saying that I was equally taken aback by the turn of events. I mentioned that she had moved in with Henry Carslake, and Paul was astonished, asking if it was the same Henry of Carslake construction. I confirmed that it was indeed the same person, and shared my suspicion that she was in love with him. Paul inquired about my plans, and I declared that I was going to give her a divorce since she didn't want anything from me. I explained that there was another form she wanted me to sign, but I had already discarded it. Curious, Paul asked about the nature of that form, and I explained that she wanted me to give the kids to him for adoption, emphasizing that it was not going to happen. Paul shook his head in disgust and made a remark about Carslake, to which I added defiantly that I had been scheduled to start working for him on Monday, but had decided to find another job instead. In the end, I signed the divorce papers, despite Helen's attempts to persuade me otherwise, and she eventually gave up. When the divorce was finalized, Chloe was 10 and Lee was 8. I wanted to get back at Carslake, but I didn't want to land in jail for it. 
I never showed up for work on Monday, and strangely, no one seemed to press me about it. Part of my revenge on Carslake occurred without my involvement. It stemmed from my conversation with Paul. Word got out and most local contractors refused to work with Carslake Construction. They saw how he had treated me, so they refused his projects. While Henry found other contractors, they were subpar, and the work quality suffered. After six months, my divorce became official. Three months later, Helen and Govniuk got married. I took care of the kids for a week while they went on their honeymoon. I didn't do it to help them. I just figured a week was better than the limited time I had on weekends. What bothered me was my daughter Chloe's question. Daddy, why did you send us to live with Mom and Henry? What? I didn't send you. Your mother took you because she doesn't love me anymore. If it was up to me, you could have stayed here. I responded, clarifying that it wasn't my choice and that I planned to discuss it with Helen. When Helen arrived to pick up the kids, she seemed tanned and cheerful. I told Helen to stop lying and urged her to tell the kids the truth. I warned her that if she didn't, I would. I mentioned that the kids knew I didn't ask her to take them in and that I'd fight for custody if I could. Helen walked away in frustration. Life as a single man felt strange after being married for so long. Some friends tried to set me up on dates, but I didn't feel like dating. I wanted love, but wasn't in the mood for dating. Little did I know that my life was about to change. My neighbors were Gary and Emily, who had moved in just after Helen left. Their house was a good deal for them, but needed a lot of work. Emily worked as a secretary, and Gary was a retired army man. We got along well, and they seemed like a nice couple. Whenever we crossed paths, we had friendly conversations. Tragedy struck when Gary had a sudden health crisis at work. Paramedics and a doctor arrived quickly, but Gary was pronounced dead at the scene. The autopsy revealed he had died from a subdural hematoma. Emily was left in distress and alone. I offered her my sympathy, and since her parents were on vacation, I walked her home and poured us drinks. I listened to her as she sobbed and shared her future plans. Emily cried and fell asleep on my couch. I covered her with a blanket and slept in a chair in case she woke up during the night. The next morning as Emily was leaving, Helen was dropping off the kids. Good to see you're not wasting any time, Mike. Come on, Helen. The poor woman just lost her husband. Helen glanced at me, then turned to talk to the kids. Later that day I explained to them why Emily was leaving the house. Chloe seemed sad and I don't think Lee fully understood. Emily later invited me to attend Gary's funeral, which I did. Thankfully in the UK mortgages are insured, so Emily wouldn't be left destitute. This was little comfort given her loss. Emily's parents returned from Europe and spoke to me. After the funeral, I assured them that I would look out for Emily since, apart from my co-workers, I was her only friend. I offered to help with minor household tasks to keep her place in a livable condition. The next time Helen picked up the kids, she remained in the car, which was fine with me since I had no desire to talk to her. Emily and I spent a fair amount of time together, not as a couple, but as friends supporting each other. About a year later, I heard Lee chatting with Emily in the garden. I called out to him, asking him not to be a pest, but Emily said it was okay as she hung laundry on the clothesline. I suggested to Emily if she would like to have dinner with us that night. Lee wanted Emily to join us and we all shared a laugh. After dinner, Emily helped me prepare dinner and it was clear she was skilled in the kitchen. After dinner, she assisted with the cleanup and sat with us for a while before heading home. I thanked Emily for dinner and for accepting the invitation as she left. Chloe asked me with a smile if Emily was my girlfriend. I replied to Chloe that Emily was just a friend and neighbor, though secretly I thought it would be nice if she were my girlfriend. I kept that to myself, away from the kids. On a Sunday afternoon, Helen picked up the kids. I knew they would tell her about Emily joining us for dinner, and I was right. The next time Helen came to get the kids, she was particularly interested in Emily. I told Helen that Emily was just a friend and that what I did was none of her business. Helen mentioned that she didn't get everything she wanted. I retorted that she left me for a life of luxury with him and that he could have his own kids if he wanted them. I expressed my strong opposition to him adopting our children, emphasizing how he had taken my wife and ruined our marriage. Helen pouted and walked home, but I smiled knowing I had upset her. A year later, I hadn't seen Emily for a few weeks, partly because I was very busy. My friend Paul was rewiring a house for a young couple and asked me to make an offer on a complete plumbing rewire. My offer was accepted, 
and I had a busy few weeks getting everything finished. While working on the house with Paul, he kept me up to date with news about Cars Lake. He still had to use a lot of non-local professionals since most of the local guys refused to work for him. With the work on the house completed, I finally had some time to relax. I decided to take Emily out to dinner. She agreed, and we set a time for Saturday night. When I walked in behind Emily, it took my breath away. She was a petite woman with a pixie-cut hairstyle. The dress she wore accentuated her slim figure, and for the first time, I started to feel attracted to her. Dinner went well, and we spent a lot of time discussing our lives. Later that evening, I walked Emily to her door, and she expressed her gratitude for a wonderful evening. I smiled in response, and before I could reply, she surprised me with a passionate kiss that left me breathless. Afterward, she suggested that we go out again to see where things might lead and bid me good night, kissing me on the cheek this time. We did go out again, and this time it led to us spending the night together. Despite her small stature, Emily was incredibly passionate, and it was a thoroughly satisfying experience. As Emily and I spent more time together, she eventually sold her house and moved in with me. The kids were pleased with my dating life, and it was clear that they would inform Helen, who wasn't thrilled about it. She didn't want me, but Emily did. A year after our first intimate encounter, Emily and I got married. When the kids informed Helen, she simply snorted and turned away. Emily and I went on to have two children of our own, Gary and Robert. My older children were now old enough to visit on their own, which reduced my contact with Helen. Years passed, and one day, Chloe announced her engagement. Her boyfriend Josh had proposed the night before. As her father, I offered to help with the wedding expenses. Chloe explained that they initially thought they wouldn't need financial assistance. But Henry had offered to cover the costs with the condition that he would walk her down the aisle. Chloe refused, and Henry withdrew his financial support, leaving her upset. I was frustrated with Carslake for his actions, and Emily suggested using the money from the sale of her house to cover the expenses. I hesitated, considering it was her money. But she insisted and encouraged me to inform Chloe that we would cover the costs. Chloe was overjoyed when I shared the news, and we established a budget that accommodated everything they wanted for the wedding while staying under budget. The following day, Chloe informed me that Henry was furious, and Helen was clearly unhappy. One afternoon, Lee showed up unannounced in our garden, wanting to leave home because he was tired of hearing his mother and Henry argue. Emily asked if they were still arguing about the wedding, but Lee revealed it was something else. He mentioned overhearing their intimate moments and suggested that Henry wasn't performing well in bed. We shared a laugh about the situation, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction that Helen had left me for someone who couldn't fulfill his responsibilities when it mattered. Lee decided to stay the night at our house to avoid any conflicts at home. On Chloe and Josh's wedding day, Helen didn't seem pleased. Chloe told her that she and Henry would sit behind Emily and me during the ceremony. The church service went smoothly. I agreed to have Helen sit at the top table at the reception. Meanwhile, Henry sat with Emily, Robert, Gary, and Lee. After all the speeches, the caterers removed a few tables to make space for dancing. Josh and Chloe led the first dance, and Emily and I joined them, along with Helen and Henry. Later, we found ourselves at the bar, and Gary and Robert were sitting with one of Chloe's bridesmaids and her children. Lee asked Emily if she wanted to dance, and I encouraged him to go for it. Helen took the opportunity to approach me, clearly having had a few drinks, and I had a sense that this encounter might not end well. She began commenting on Emily and me, remarking how young Emily looked and how she hadn't aged despite being the mother of two boys. Helen then went on to criticize Emily's appearance, mentioning her weight and attire. I reminded her that we were divorced, and she no longer had the right to comment on my life. Helen continued to make derogatory remarks about Emily, and I defended my wife, telling Helen that Emily was more of a woman than she ever was. I even hinted at my satisfying, intimate life with Emily. Helen was left stunned as Henry joined the conversation. I pointed out to Helen that when she left me, she thought she was trading up for something better, and maybe she was, or wasn't, but I had moved on. I had my own life, a loving wife, and four wonderful children. I walked away, leaving Helen and Henry to their own devices. Emily and I danced to slow music, and as we danced, she asked me about the exchange at the bar. I told her to kiss me, promising to explain later. We shared a kiss, knowing that Helen was watching. 
After breaking the kiss, I smiled at Helen, who turned away to order another drink. As I looked at Emily, I couldn't help but think that I had indeed traded up for something better in my life.